Thank you, Stephen. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mohammed Al Qureshi, who's visiting us from Colombia. Mohammed um, got his uh, bachelor's degrees in um, computer science, biology, and mathematics, a uh, master's in statistics, a PhD in genetics from Stanford University, um, and um, uh, was a systems biology fellow um, at Harvard and an assistant is now an assistant professor of systems biology at Columbia University. So sort of in line with his, uh, his multidisciplinary training, Mohammed is one of the pioneers uh, in the field of uh, deep learning as applied to biology uh, and in particular protein structure prediction. Uh, and his lab has uh, made a number of very important advances uh, and uh, I look forward to your talk. Thank you again for coming, Mohammed. And without further ado, Mohammed Al Quraish. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, should I continue to use this, or does this work? Or I guess does this work? Okay. Uh, so let me try to share my screen. All right. So, are we all good as far as the sharing? Excellent. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you very much for hosting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my first time at Rutgers and uh, I was actually had a very nice morning so far and just seeing the campus is also very, very nice and beautiful. Um, so, right, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our work, um, so our recent work um, on, on, on OpenFold, uh, which is um, it's, it sort of started out as an, an, as an effort to essentially reproduce AlphaFold 2, uh, but it has, I think, since kind of morphed into something which I hope is sort of more interesting and more, more ambitious. Um, but, but I'll get into that. I'll get into that in a moment. I think before before we get into OpenFold, just for can we ask Michelle to just move, move those images on the right side? Um, minimize that. Sorry, huh? so that we can see the slides. Can I do it? Huh. Thanks. Cool. Um, let me get that. Right. Yeah. So before before we went to before we get into OpenFold, um, I thought it's, it's worthwhile just making sure everybody's on the same page in terms of what AlphaFold is and, and what's happened in the last couple of years, uh, which is really you know really quite quite uh, remarkable, I think, and extraordinary. Um, so, so you know the, the focus of the talk is is not surprisingly going to be on this question of, of predicting structure from sequence, right? And this is you know been 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 the area where we've seen the most progress in the last. Um, couple of years. Um, but I just want to point out that there is kind of a broader set of problems right, that we're interested in as molecular modelers, you know, including things like protein-protein interactions, uh, you know, uh, predicting the, the binding of small molecules to proteins, nucleic acids, and so on. Um, and so there's sort of a whole zoo of questions that we'd like to, to make progress on, um, even if kind of the, 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 the first forays or the first really kind of impressive advances we've seen from deep learning have been focused on, on just protein structure prediction. And as I'll talk about later on, you know, with OpenFold, you know, our, our sort of intent is to make it a platform so that we can go after these related problems so that we not just focus on structure prediction, but other, other kind of proximal uh, problem. Um, now, having said that, so there, there is there has been this sort of revolution in, in protein structure prediction, and, and we can we can sort of think about it in different ways. So. Um, one way of thinking about it is in terms of progress in the quality of predicted structure. So there's, there's this competition that happens every two years called CASP uh, that, that assesses in a blind fashion uh, the, the quality of predicted structures. And this has been going on for over 20 years now. Um, and I would say for much of the, certainly much of the 2000s and the 2010s, the space, the field was fairly stagnant. Um, so what I'm plotting here on the kind of the, on the left is essentially the, the accuracy, the average accuracy measured in RMSD of predicted protein structures relative to, uh, you know, relative to experimental structures in what's called the CASP free modeling category, which is which is a category focused on sort of de novo prediction. So, so structures that don't look homologous to anything we know in the PDB. That, that's sort of the intent, at least. Um, and like I said, for much of the 2000s and the 2010s, there, there was really very little progress. Um, but this began to change, you know, with the, with the development of the first alpha fold uh, in 2018, and then certainly with the development of alpha fold two in 2020. Um, and, and there's sort of two important things to note here. So the first alpha fold uh, was, as you can see, you know, a qualitative leap in accuracy. So you know, clearly, you know, really big jump. Um, but I was, I would characterize this as still being primarily interesting to methodological, to method developers, to people who think about methodological developments, right? In the sense that the accuracy was still sufficiently poor that that it was not sort of of immediate use to biologists, right? This really changed the alpha fold too. And I think this is partly why, you know, I think the field as a whole sort of changed because um, 
while still not uh, comparable to experiments, it's of sufficient fidelity to be useful, right? People can make, you know, can build hypotheses, can look at predictive structures and, and gain insights that you wouldn't be able to, to do with, with sitting with the first version of AFFALS, for example, or prior methods. So that, that's, I think, one, one key thing that's happened. Uh, and, and I, I would say sort of almost in a way, kind of shed light now on all these computational tools because it it suggests that they've that have finally kind of come of age and are of sort of broad utility to the biology community. I think I think I, I would as a computational biologist, I think I can say that you know much of the methodological development that happened at least in molecular modeling was sort of interesting methodologically for their own sake, but they weren't yet useful to biologists, right, the broader community. And I think I think this is really has has changed now, and it's, it's these things have become kind of broadly useful. Um, the other thing which I think is interesting with, with AlphaFold 1 and 2 is that with the first one, uh, methodologically, it's actually fairly kind of hewed fairly closely to the existing uh, paradigm. It wasn't very different in terms of the way it did things. It, it did result in a leap of accuracy, but that leap was primarily a result of engineering, so better engineering. With AlphaFold 2, there were really a number of methodological advances, conceptual advances uh, that, that DeepMind introduced. Uh, that I think um, both moved the feed forward, uh, the, the field forward, but also but also, you know, made the, the method much more accurate, right? And so, so in, in a way, it's it's both sort of better, but it's also better for sort of good reason, right? It's sort of new ideas, which, which I think is always nice to see in these types of uh, problems. Um, and so nowadays, it's not unusual, right, that if you're trying to predict the structure of a protein, even one that has, again, no homologous structures in the PDB, that you'd get something that looks like the picture on the right, right? Where, you know, I think the ground truth is in blue and the prediction is in green, and you see very, very sort of good superposition of the two, of the two structures. Uh, so just to get a kind of a sense of, of where things currently stand with AlphaFold 2, right? I would say that you know it's quite good at predicting single proteins, um, as well as as well as complexes in many instances, but but not as not as good. Uh, it does often struggle with things like multi-domain proteins, where there may be some flexible chains uh, or rather flexible uh, linkers that that sort of you know result in different uh, different sort of overall uh, conformational um, you know conformational states of the protein. Um, where it struggles quite a bit um, is is with single sequences or the mutations, right? So if you if you have a pathogenic variant that you know is structurally disruptive, uh, alpha is not particularly informative in that regard. Um, and in fact, in the just um, the just concluded Cas15, in concluded last last December, there were a handful of targets where the you know where the, where the focus was on structurally disruptive mutations, and in, and in those instances, all the methods that were tested essentially failed. Uh, so now no one is really yet able to predict the impact of structurally disruptive mutations. Um, and what, what sort of can't handle at all so far are, are things like ligands, uh, you know, you know non-protein non based ligands, so small molecules, things like that, um, modified amino acids, environmental conditions, right? I think that's going to go beyond just sort of proteins. Um, and, and one way, one example I often like to give to sort of sort of capture the, 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 this idea um, is this particular target from Cas14, T1056. Um, so you see the, you know, again, the overall structures well predicted, including actually the, the kind of the side chains. Uh, in, in this particular active site. This is, bind, is binding a zinc ion, uh, and the prediction is quite good. But what's sort of almost ironic about all this, right, is, is, is the fact that um, AlphaFold doesn't have any intuition, doesn't have any understanding of, of, of zinc ions. It doesn't have an understanding of any ions, right? So it's giving the right answer, but for the wrong reasons. Uh, it sort of essentially kind of knows from having seen enough of these patterns in the PDB that there ought to be something there that coordinates those atoms, right? And so it gives you the kind of the right, the right answer. But it's not doing so because of sort of an underlying understanding that the zinc ion is necessary to coordinate these these side chains, uh, and I think this is important because it's both a limit. Well, it's, it's a feature in the sense that you get the right answer whether whether you say you want it or not. So that maybe you know that's that's good in a way. But it's a, it's a it's a it's a a problem in the sense that if you want to be able to vary say environmental conditions, right, uh, it's not something that you can currently do and get a different answer from AlphaFold, right? It's, it's sort of really quite. Uh, you know, the, the way I like to think about it is that it's basically a crystal structure predictor. It's giving you some sort of prediction based on what I see in the PDB, but it's not directly solving the physics problem. And, and most of the time, that's good enough, but not all the time, right? And that's that's a key a key limitation. Um, one other point I think uh, with was just kind of drawing your attention to is the fact that uh, the predictions that Alfold makes are calibrated. And I, I think this is another reason why it, it's been adopted quite broadly by the biology community. Uh, so what I'm showing here on the left are... Uh, so each dot is a protein, uh, and the and the y-axis is essentially a measure. It's called LDDT of the accuracy of of the kind of the, you can think of the local geometry around that protein, roughly speaking. Um, and then uh, on the x-axis is the average p LDDT. So the p is a prediction. So so here alpha fold is predicting its own accuracy. Right? It's trying to essentially ascertain how good is the how good is its own prediction, right? 
and you see that these things are generally correlated, reasonably, reasonably well correlated, um, which, is, which is good news because now we're able to um, look at a structure like this and then just based on the color coding, sort of know that the blue regions are sort of high confidence and we can trust them and can make inferences about them. But then the, the stuff in yellow and orange, maybe not so much, right? Um, and often these regions are actually disordered. So, so they may not simply have a well-defined native state. Uh, but but, but that, that I think, again, made it sort of immediately useful because, because a biologist could look at the structure and decide how and where to use it. Um, and, and another way this sort of shows up is, in, is when, you, when one sort of does some large scale predictions, right? So, um, so they, they, in fact, in a deep mind, when they released the off-fault two method paper, they had gone and, and applied it to the human proteome um, and then tried to assess sort of how much additional structural coverage one gets uh, because, you know, through AlphaFold. Um, so the way they do this is, is as a function of the template identity cutoff, right? So what, what they essentially ask is, you know, for a given, given chunk of protein, given fragment, um, what is the closest homolog in the PDB, right? What, what is the closest sequence homology? Uh, what, what is the closest homolog in the PDB? You know, what, what is the sequence identity of the closest homolog in the PDB? And that's what's plotted on the x-axis, right? And then as a function of that, uh, they're asking essentially, so the stuff in, in light shade is actual crystal, you know, actual XML structures in the PDB. And then the stuff that's in dark shade um, are off fault predictions uh, at different levels of, of predicted confidences, right? So the kind of the light blue and the dark blue are reasonably well predicted regions, or highly, highly high, high confidence regions. Uh, and so what you see is that if you, you know, if you're very kind of particular and say, I really want a perfect match in the PDB, then the gain um, by outfall is something like a factor of three or four in terms of human proteome coverage. Uh, this of course shrinks as you are more permissive as the, and, and as you allow sort of, um, you know, more distant homologs to, to, uh, to uh, stand in as templates, um, but but still there is there, there does remain a gain, uh, and now what's interesting actually in this in this regard is that if you um, if you to ask how good is the alpha two prediction um, when sort of when when almost uh, formulated as a template uh, and and and, and you know, in terms of the sequence identity right so so if you ask you know is if I have a 90 percent sequence identity template is that as good as an alpha two prediction or if I have a fifty percent sequence identity template is that as good as an alpha two prediction and and if you do that kind of exercise it turns out that alpha two is roughly comparable to a 90% sequence identity template, right? Uh, so really where you, where you should be looking is essentially kind of this line here, that's sort of roughly the, 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 where the kind of practically speaking, it's sort of performing, right? Um, this is of course kind of modular the question I mentioned earlier about variants and mutations and so on, where it's not sensitive to these, but at least if you have a kind of a naturally occurring protein that you expect to, to you know, to, 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 to fold as sort of intended, if you may, as nature intended, and that's roughly what, how, how good it is, right? which, which is quite good. Okay. So, so that's a sort of for kind of the quick just overview of AlphaFold and, and you know what, what, what's happened in the last couple of years. Uh, so, so let me sort of shift gears and, and tell you about so our effort now. Uh, like I said, it sort of started out, at, uh, you know, focused on reproducing AlphaFold too, but now it's gone, it's gone beyond it. Um, I should say before I sort of jump into this, uh, just to, to clarify. So uh, DeepMind was actually very, I think, you know, generous and a sort of a good academic kind of uh, you know, citizen uh, when they released AlphaFold because they, they, they made the, the model waste available. So you could take these model waste and, and then do inference and predicting structures. And that's been, you know, widely used, obviously. Um, and they did, make a, they did make a part of the code available. So the code for making predictions was in fact made available, you know, essentially the week that the, that the paper was published. Um, what was not made available was the training code, right? So if one wanted to train a new version of AlphaFold, that wasn't readily available. And in particular, if one wanted to sort of, let's say, modify this architecture in some way, right, um, or say has private data, you know, if you're pharmaceutical and you have certain, certain crystallographic structures that are not uh, in the PDB, you want to fine tune out that data, that wasn't possible uh, using the AlphaFold uh, uh, code base, right? Um, so from our perspective, one thing that we wanted to do, you know, uh, you know to begin with was to reproduce the results, right, because it wasn't entirely clear that, um, I mean, either, even though I think they were quite um, quite good about describing the details of what they did in the paper, you know, one never knows, of course, until one reproduces a model that, that you could actually get the same exact results starting from scratch, right? And so th this was kind of the, the very first motivation. Uh, but we had, we had a couple of other ones. So, right, so, so the first one, like I mentioned, is sort of full scale training, being able to, to, to do this. And in particular, I think, you know, our intention was to think about new applications, right, as I'll talk about in a moment, and, and, and sort of gear or, or um, yeah, sort of repurpose off of fold for those, for those other applications. Um, the other was to essentially kind of modularize the system, right? So instead of having like one monolithic code base, it's to kind of divide it up into pieces so that people can kind of mix and match those pieces uh, and integrate them into the workflows for various applications, as, as I'll show in a, in a moment. 
Um, and the third piece, and that ended up being the, the bulk of the work actually, so that's the one I'm going to focus on for the most part, uh, was actually more now knowledge acquisition. So, so gaining sort of new insights in terms of how AlphaFold learns and, 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 and getting a better assessment of its capabilities uh, when, when presented with proteins that it hasn't seen. Um, so that, that's where I'll spend the most of my time, but, but I'll walk through each of these just briefly uh, to, give you, to give you a setup. Uh, so let me start with, with kind of the full scale training. Um, so very, very, very quickly, right after Alpha 2 was published, uh, a bunch of papers came out focused on um, on, on applying it in the context of, of multimeric uh, complexes, right? saying, can, can we actually predict complexes using Alpha Fold? Um, and the, the, kind of the, the idea, uh, you know, uh, the, those, those two folks came up with that idea uh, independently over, over Twitter, <laughs> which is sort of interesting, uh, was, was really quite simple, was, okay, can we just sort of re-gig Alpha Fold for this purpose by... Um, by taking two proteins, stitching them with a flexible linker, and just feeding that that sort of you know that stitched complex, if you may, into AlphaFold. Um, and lo and behold, and you know here you're seeing kind of superposition between the ground two, the experimental structure and the prediction. It's actually pretty pretty decent, right? Um, and this this I will I have to say is really quite surprising because um, AlphaFold in this context was never trained to, to on complexes. It was only trained on monomers, right? So the fact that it's sort of able to generalize in this way, and if you know anything about machine learning, this is a fairly difficult task, right? Because it's 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 a very um, kind of fundamental distributional shift to the underlying data set. But it's able to sort of do that, right? And that, that I think was an indication to me at least that it's really learned some general principles about protein folding and protein structure kind of uh, determinants that, that, that I was able to sort of uh, do this so well. But but anyway, this was kind of a clear indication that you could sort of, again, uh, slightly slightly sort of tweak AlphaFold to give you something um, like this. Uh, so, you know, a, a few enterprising groups actually very, were very quick to, to take this approach and then apply it, in this case, to the uh, used uh, proteome to sort of predict complexes of, of you know, choreoperatic machinery, um, as well as the human proteome to predict, you know, various human complexes. Um, probably a little bit less successful here than the, in, in the case of yeast, because often these multiple sequence alignments are not as deep, uh, but still, you know, quite a, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of progress. So, uh, so one way of quantifying this is, is the following. So here I'm showing you different methods focused on predicting multimeric interfaces, right? Multimeric complexes. Uh, the one in green, the class pro, the kind of middle one, as you can, is, is what was essentially the state of the art prior to AlphaFold, right? So this is what this is what's kind of the, the standard. And what the, the kind of the, the, the metric I'm using here is called doc hue. This is essentially a measure of how, how good the interface is. If it's on 0.3, you could sort of consider that to be a pretty good prediction. Um, so anything above that is sort of, you know, is in some ways, you know, a reasonable, reasonable average. Um, so what we see is that um, class pro was, you know, it was just, just below that, right? Uh, prior to alpha 2. Then all the, all the methods in the kind of the bottom, the bottom four, or bottom five, um, alpha linker, gap, et cetera, et cetera. Those are methods which took alpha hold and just did some variant of that trick I mentioned to you, right? You know, in terms of feeding it a concatenated sequence. Um, and no retraining. Right? So these were, these were just literally taking the alpha fold two method, the alpha fold two weights, and, and, and giving it new inputs. And of course, you see, you know, substantial gains, right? And that's, that's kind of what's remarkable about this is how well it's worked. Um, however, and, and this is what's sort of, you know, kind of really interesting, right? Is that uh, DeepMind said, okay, what, what about if we just take the alpha fold architecture, essentially unchanged, and just simply retrain it? On multimeric complexes, right? How well would we do if we were to do that? Uh, and that's that's the kind of the, the, the cyan, right? That's the top curve. Um, so so what you see, you know, relative to this, you know, again substantial gain, I guess in the kind of the red, the red del bar, you see yet another substantial gain um, obtained by by this retraining, right? Uh, so, but of course, you know, the, the key thing here is that the only group that could do that at the time was DeepMind because they're the only ones who had the training code, right? So they could they could actually train this from scratch. Um, but but I think it sort of communicated to us the value of even not not introducing any architectural changes, just simply retraining on a new data set. What that can potentially give you in terms of a, in terms of a gain. So that 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 was a strong motivation. Uh, okay, that's that's for one. Now as far as modular components, um, yeah. So th this is sort of a, a, a high level sketch of the default to architecture, you know, from 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 DeepMind. Um, and if you to sort of you know crack open some of those components. Uh, you, you would find only sort of really interesting operations. So, so one of them um, that maybe some of you are familiar with is this notion of a of an attention mechanism. It's a, it's a general purpose kind of neural network technology that lets you know one region of the protein kind of attend to or sort of pay attention to other regions of the protein. This is fairly general purpose technology. This is using natural language and so on. Uh, but what DeepMind did in this case was sort of augmented with various kind of geometric almost intuitions or priors uh, to make it uh, to make it sort of behave in a way that is suited for geometric reasoning. So this is obviously kind of a general purpose tool that's useful. Right? One wants to use it in various contexts for any kind of molecular modeling, all, all the various kind of applications I mentioned in the very beginning. 
Um, and so it makes sense to kind of modularize it and expose it as a, as a core function. Um, and in fact, uh, I guess as an indication of this, you know, that there, there's already been work on, for example, you know, repurposing, repurposing some of this technology for RNA structure prediction, uh, for sort of invoice folding, uh, for protein design and so on. And these all use those components uh, or, or similar components to AlphaFold. So, so that was sort of another kind of idea here, right? just, just to make that in a, in a modular way, just to make it um, uh, more accessible and more usable by the community. And I, and I think that's, that, that has proven to be the case since, since OpenFold came out. Um, okay, so that, now let me kind of get into the the, the, the the part of the matter, which is which is kind of the production and some of the knowledge uh, knowledge acquisition. Um, I, I will say just so you know, parenthetically, uh, you know, so that, that you may have heard of ESM falls from Meta, which is you know a great tool uh, that that sort of predicts structures using language models, not using multiple sequence alignments, but just from an individual sequence, and that's that's been very popular. And that in fact was built on OpenFall, so that that's been something kind of very gratifying to see that the community was very quick to to be able to use it to actually you know build new build new applications. And in fact, uh, maybe two weeks. Ago, there was a, a method called Alpha Link, which was uh, again built using OpenFold to integrate uh, structural information into the prediction task. So, so, so essentially, using kind of structural constraints um, in lieu of NMSA or in addition to MNSA to make a prediction, and that that uh, uh, that that seems to work quite well. I think it was Nature by Tech paper. So, so you know, quite quite pleased to see to see that progress. Okay, so let me first just kind of establish that it actually works well. So again, this is kind of a, a fresh model from scratch, trained from the PDB, uh, trained on the PDB uh, to to essentially you know emulate the, the behavior of AlphaFold two. Uh, but but the, the model is essentially identical, but it implements completely you know a new from scratch in a different framework. Um, and so you see, you know, this is a scatter plot. Sometimes you know AlphaFold does better, sometimes OpenFold does better. Uh, but that's that's just because it's uh, you know it's the enhanced stochasticity of the of the of the of the models. There isn't anything. I, you know, I wouldn't get into into this uh, very much. Uh, but in general, in terms of sort of mean accuracy, it's very comparable. It's probably this is actually of, a, of an older drop of the model, so now maybe it's slightly better than AlphaFold too. But it's, it's very similar. Um, and yeah, and, and if you sort of superpose the the, I think the. The ground truth is in white, uh, alpha fold is in blue, and, and open fold is in pink. You know, you see very, very high uh, correspondence in general, except for a handful where they, where they sometimes diverge in, in, in both ways. Um, so, okay, so that, that's one aspect that it's, it's as, as accurate. Uh, but we were also interested in making it sort of perhaps maybe better in some ways, particularly on the inference side, and, and so making it faster and more usable. Uh, so, so uh, you know, we, we in part because uh, AlphaFold was sort of trained on kind of Google's internal TPUs, so it wasn't really optimized for commercially available GPUs that you know we all use, right? That you know that are that are sort of semi-cheap. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily optimized for those architectures, and so we were able to kind of optimize them for for, for for more kind of commercial GPUs and get get higher higher. Um, uh, speeds. Um, we also, this goes into the weeds a little bit, but we also sort of incorporated various optimizations. Uh, the key thing is to allow it to kind of uh, predict the larger chains, right? So often with AlphaFold, you sort of peter out around 2,000 residues, but with OpenFold, you know, you can go all, all the way up to, I think, 4,600 residues uh, on a single GPU. Um, and I should say, you know, everything I'm saying here is applicable to the AlphaFold two weights. So if, if for whatever reason it's like you don't want to use OpenFold weights, you're not, you don't really trust it, uh, you can always just use the code base and use uh, DeepMind's weights and and you know and and get, gain the advantage advantages that I'm describing uh, here. Um, and, and the idea more broadly is to sort of have a mechanism where one can train speed for memory. So you could, if you want to make an, an inference of a very large complex, you can, uh, but you just have to wait longer. And it might have to wait a you know, very long time, but but you can at least you can at least make that sort of trade off. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip some of the some of the details here. Okay, so um, uh, well, all right. I'll, I'll push my kind of last technical point in case somebody's interested, which is uh, the, the nice thing about this as well now is that we can actually now train it using what's called lower precision. Um, this may be sort of a, a very technical detail, but the key point here is that you can actually train this model now really using sort of fairly old GPUs. So so stuff that's kind of lying around and in, in, in sort of you know, an academic cluster from five or six years ago can be used to train AlphaFold. It's still a lot of compute that goes into this, but it can be done uh, in, in principle. I think somebody raised their hand on Zoom. No, nope. all right. I can, Why don't we come back to that? At the end? Yeah, I'll just. Uh... All right. So um, right, so so just FYI, you know, there, there is a nice feature. Um, 
Oh, and, and actually, another kind of this this is more uh, an important point as well. So one issue is the the MSAs that we use to train alpha folds, right? Th th those weren't available either, and those are fairly expensive to generate because you know we, we search the, every entry in the PDB, and you want to generate uh, an MSA for it, and not just that, but then uh, there's this kind of what's called self distillation where um, you you use an initial vision of alpha fold to make a whole bunch of predictions. You look at the most highly accurate ones, and then for those, uh, one uses them then as a, as training data for for a next iteration of alpha fold, and that's that's in the in the, in the first paper. Um, so for, so we compute this, those multiple sequence alignments for all those structures, and that's that's I think is is a, a valuable resource for people wanting to train new models. Okay, so now we start kind of digging into into how it's behaving and how it's learning as as it's training, and and we we I think already started making some interesting observations. Um, so the first thing is that the model seems to observe, uh, um, to, uh, seems to exhibit rather very fast convergence, right? So to train a full model, it took us about 80 days with 44 GPUs, right? So that's a fairly large, uh, you know, compute investment. Most people can't can't do that, uh, and, and we can't really internally. We we, ha we had we had help from from external partners. Um, However, you can essentially get that same performance, about 90% of it, in two to three days, right? So alpha sort of very quickly rises in terms of accuracy and then kind of plateaus. And that's fairly important for several reasons, right? Because if you're, for example, interested in exploring model architectures, you know, trying to kind of explore hyperparameter space and see how that behaves, you don't need to run the full training thing, right? You could just do it for a couple of days and see how well it does, and then, and then sort of, you know, alter your, your plan. Um, similarly, for you know, for things like if you're trying to fine tune on data or what have you, um, this suggests that you can get a pretty quick signal early on, and I think that's that's quite valuable. Um, another somewhat technical point here, but uh, in alpha, there's sort of a, a two-stage process in the way it's trained, where essentially the, the size of the proteins or the protein fragments that are considered in training is increased, and this is a very very expensive procedure. About two thirds of the training is dominated by this by this uh, operation, and what we discovered is that this seems to primarily solve or resolve physical violations. It doesn't really seem to change overall accuracy. It just kind of refines and makes the structures better. Uh, so this too is an example of something that can potentially be skipped if your primary your interest is developing kind of new variants of, 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 of alpha fold. Um, okay, so, so then we start kind of digging into how the model behaves as it's being trained, right? How, how, how is it making predictions and, and how, those, how those predictions kind of evolve as, as that training progresses? So the first thing we noticed, let me, let me just kind of first calibrate you because I'm gonna come back to this sort of story over and over again. One thing just to say, so everything I'm going to show you now, from now on essentially is going to focus on that initial rapid rise phase. That, that's the first 10,000, 5,000 steps because that's really kind of where, the, where most of the action is. Uh, so I, sometimes that won't be the case and I'll mention it, but otherwise I'm gonna mostly focus on that region. And, and in general, um, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll sort of orient you, but, but in general it's going to be, you know, something as a function of training iteration. So, so here, color uh, encodes the training step, right? So how, how far in the training process is alpha fold essentially? Uh, and then the, the dots here correspond to sort of the average accuracy of an alpha fold two model as, as it's being trained. Um, so so, what, so the, the, what this slide is, is uh, summarizing is this question of the self-calibration, right? I told you that it predicts its own accuracy. Um, and so what you see is that in the, kind of the, in the green region, right, when it first starts, um, it's quite poor. And it's in accuracy and maybe a little bit optimistic in terms of how well it's doing. Um, then it sort of proceeds in this kind of intermediate regime where it's actually a little bit pessimistic, right? Where it's not so good, but it's, it's, it's like I said, it's pessimistic. It's, it's predicting itself to be worse than it actually is. Um, and then finally, when it kind of reaches that red regime where it's becoming much more accurate, it's still a little bit pessimistic, uh, but, but generally speaking, you know, it, it's, it's closer to the ground truth. Um, now, what's interesting though is that throughout this process, it's still generally well calibrated. Right? And that's actually something which is quite important, right? Because you know, one might think that the only time you, um, you're you able to sort of, that alpha is able to self-assess is when it sort of finally reaches sort of maturity, when it's pretty accurate, right? You know, in the, in the late stages of training. But what this suggests is that, you know, especially throughout this, the training process, more or less, right? It's able to self-assess. And that's, that's really, again, valuable when we're thinking about new modalities and new types of data that we want to train on, that, that we, we will get that signal early on and we, we'll have a sense of how, the, how well the model is working without having to wait very long. Um, another thing we're interested in is, is how it begins to acquire structural knowledge. Right? How does it actually, you know, is, is, there, is there a process or is there some sort of, um, uh, is there a st structure, if you may, with no pun intended, to the way structure is learned, right? Um, so, so first we looked at secondary structure elements. 
And, and perhaps not surprisingly, again, as a function of training, so x-axis here is training. And then the y-axis here is sort of a score of how well, uh, how well the structure is being recovered. So 100% is like perfect, zero, zero is, is poor. Uh, and so what you see is not surprisingly um, that certainly helices that's in green, right, are learned a bit before sheets are learned, right? And, and I say not surprising because these are more perhaps sort of local elements, right? Things that are driven by more, more local interactions. And so it's not shocking that alpha will begin to, to sort of infer them more accurately before it gets to the sort of more long range interactions that are involved in, in beta sheet formation. Uh, it's, a, it's a short gap, but it's an important gap because of that sort of exponential rise in accuracy. And so just to be clear, as, as case is not obvious, I'm referring to kind of this gap between those two, those two curves. Um, and in fact, we can kind of break this up and look at sort of finer grain secondary structure elements. Uh, and, and then you see this kind of, you know, sort of staggering in some cases. Um, now, what's interesting, uh, a, few, a few points here. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I take back a little bit what I said earlier in terms of the early, early rapid rise phase, right? Because now here we do show it all the way to the end, 92,000 steps. And what you see is that even though things like, let me see if I could use if my cursor shows. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So even though you know this gap here is rather small, so these are beta sheets and alpha helices, uh, there's not much more gained right by that you know twenty time x training uh, regimen. Uh, things like proline helices actually show a much more significant uh, rise in accuracy, right? So so some of the more you know let's say infrequent secondary structure elements do so disproportionately gain in accuracy as as you continue training. Um, and there is something of, a, of an inverse relationship here where the, um, you know, the, 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 the less frequently something is seen, the longer it takes to train. If, if that makes sense. Seen in the PDB, I mean, in terms of a secondary structure elements. Um, now, beyond secondary structure elements, we also see a, a sort of a multiple, a multi-scale behavior to the way it learns. Uh, so what we did here was we, we took proteins that are being predicted and we sharded them. We essentially fragmented them into small pieces and then the color here indicates sort of the, the, the length of that fragment. So, so the bluish is about you know, 10 years of fragments, while red is essentially the full length protein. Uh, and then again, we're asking what is, so GDT, so I, I switched metrics quite a bit here, but GDTS is again a measure of accuracy. Uh, 100, one is perfect, zero is bad. Um, and what you see is that, so, so actually two, two quick points. In, in the beginning, right, and, and on, the, on the left, um, sorry. Uh, on the left side, uh, this corner here, essentially everything is equally poor, right? Which is not, not surprising. And at the end here, right, on the, on the right hand side, everything is almost equally good. Not quite, you know, there's some scale dependence, right? But generally speaking, the model is actually remarkably, you know, remarkably insensitive to the size of whatever it's trying to predict. Um, however, you know, there are these sort of intermediate regions, right, particularly here, for example, right, where you see this sort of very clear separation in terms of the, 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 the accuracy of the predictions, where it first learns to predict smaller fragments before it learns to predict longer fragments. So again, this is intuitive, it's not shocking, uh, but it's, it's interesting to see this kind of scale dependence where, where uh, you know, all, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to make this analogy too seriously, but, you know, maybe a bit like folding where you, you can imagine kind of, you know, a local nucleation sites first get, get formed before kind of the global geometry and the global uh, arrangement is, is inferred. Um, and, and we see it's also on the level of secondary structure elements. So if you're looking at the length of a helix, so the color here is, is, is indicating how long a helix is, again, eventually helices of you know, all lengths are equally well predicted, but initially there's this kind of separation between, between them based on, on the length. And similarly for, for beta sheets, uh, color here indicates that the width of a sheet, how many strands go into it. And again, you see kind of similar, uh, a similar behavior. Uh, okay. Uh, I think the, the last bit about the sort of structural you know, learning um, is, is, the, is, is tissue structure itself, right? So, so one, one interesting thing we observed is that it seems to essentially learn uh, to predict structure in the sort of progression uh, from, from essentially 1D lines or 1D curves to 2D surfaces to 3D structures. So I'll, I'll show you uh, the animation because that kind of gives a sense, right? So, so what, what, what I'm showing you here, right, is our predicted structures as a function of training iteration, right, as a model is learning, right? Um, and so, you know, initially you end up with this, you have this sort of curve, right? And then you have what looks like a sheet, and then you, you have what looks like a 3D volume, uh, and then finally, secondary structure elements start getting filled in. Right? So again, it's a very clear progression in terms of the uh, in terms of the behavior of the model, and we see this, you know, across all the proteins. This is not cherry picking it in any way. This is another structure. Again, you see this sort of you know class one D line, uh, something that looks like a two D a two D sheet, uh, and then finally something that acquires volume. Right, and this is sort of very very consistent and very very sort of staggered. Um, so we want to kind of try to understand this a little bit more. 
Um, and in particular, so I'll, I'll say a few things here. So actually, one, just come back to this slide, one interesting thing that you may, you may have noticed is that GDTS, which is actually kind of the global accuracy, this, this one here, uh, if you notice, rises first here, right? So, so you see this quick rise in GDTS, and then the secondary structure elements come in, right? So this is, again, kind of consistent with what I'm showing you, where, where the details only get filled in after the overall geometry is, is learned. Um, so, so one way of, of sort of assessing this is looking at the, is looking at a, a sort of a, a, a principal component decomposition in Cartesian space. Uh, so just to be clear, so this is just literally looking at the structure and asking what is what what axis corresponds to kind of the longest axis in that structure, what axis corresponds to the second longest, and which is the, the third longest, uh, just in three D space, right? Um, and then we essentially ask um, how the model sort of recovers those those uh, axes, those components, as a function of training time. Uh, and so what you see here is, is very much cons cons consistent with what I was saying earlier, where the, the first dimension seems to be along the, the first, the, the longest axis. That, that's the blue one that gets recovered, and then the green, and then the red. So there's kind of staggering into the, how the spatial dimensions are learned um, as uh, sort of aligned with the principal components. Uh, let, let me skip this one. I think it's also critical. So so this kind of raises the question: What is it just about dimensions, or can a stronger sort of statement be made about how this is how how this learning is happening? And so what we think is actually happening is that um, is that the model is, is essentially learning staggered PCA projections of the final structure. Uh, this one kind of illustrates it more, I think. So so what we're doing here is we're taking we're taking the structure and we're sort of flattening it across those principal components, right, having to do with the with the with the axis of greatest uh, extent of the of the structure. And then we're asking, how does the structure sort of grow as it's being trained? How does it how does it change in shape, right? And what we're pl plotting here are the, so the mean displacements in Cartesian space uh, along these various dimensions as the structure is kind of unfolding, right, uh, or, or folding. And, and so what you see is that the blue, which is a lot, the first axis, spikes first, right, and then the green spikes next, and then the red spikes last, right. So there's this kind of staggering of those dimensions. Now to be sure. You know, it's not perfect, right? So you see some, you know, you see some red in the green, and you see some blue and green in the red. Uh, and this, I mean, so you know, this is this is not a, a perfectly capitulated phenomenon. And it's also because the, the the kind of lower dimensional projections are curved often, right? So that curvature is going to give you some movement in the other in the orthogonal dimensions that are going to show up as these sort of spikes in the in the you know the the blue and the green, for example, in this case. And a similar thing we see in the other in the other example. Um, and so, in fact, we can kind of sort of consider two hypothetical cases where on the, on the top left, there's sort of no staggering, all dimensions are being learned at once. And on the bottom left, there's kind of perfect staggering, where each dimension is being learned independently. And then here, what we're plotting is sort of the RMSD of these sort of flattened versions of 1D, 2D, 3D versus the final 3D structure. Um, and, and what you see in this case is that the, the, the image that we end up with is a sort of perfect staggering, much much more similar to the perfect staggering case as opposed to a no staggering case. So, so again, another sort of indication that that it really are these kind of PCA projections being learned almost uh, in sequence. Okay, uh, so that's it for the kind of the structural, you know, how, how is it learning structure piece. Uh, now let me kind of shift, shift gears a little bit and, and, and talk about data reduction. So, um, one question, obviously, in the case of DeepMind, is that they went and they trained it on the whole PDB and they got you know, very good results. But 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 how does this? How well does this generalize? If we had a PDB from 20 years ago, would, would they have gotten the same results? So we tried to, to get at this question a little bit. Um, and the way we did this was initially first was to ask, okay, what if you reduce a PDB by some fraction, right? So so the the, the, the red curve is just everything 100, percent and then in, down all the way to 0.776 percent. So you know, if after after redundancy filtering, this is on the order of like a thousand protein structures, right? So really limited set. Uh, and then here, what I'm showing here is again training behavior as a function of the LDDT score, right? So the red is sort of you know vanilla alpha fold, and, and here we took advantage of the fact that we don't need to train all the way to the end to to get a signal, so we're only training it for those first few thousand steps. So well, first, what I would say is kind of remarkable that right, is if you look at the yellowish stuff, right? You know, on the order of like 10 percent, it's very competitive with the with the red, right? So so you know a 10 percent a 10 fold reduction in number of structures randomly sampled in this case, right? doesn't actually reduce uh, accuracy all that much. Um, now, of course, when you, when you go down to, you know, 1% or 0.76%, you do see a reduction, to be sure. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I, I I'll draw your attention to, for example, this curve, right, which is, you know, quite remarkable. So this curve, right, this is on the order of, you know, 1.5%, something like that, right? So this is on the order of, again, the 1,500 protein structures. And while it's not quite competitive with alpha fold 2, it's actually better than alpha fold 1. 
right? Alcohol one was around 0.6 on, on, on this line. So, and, and, and that blue, bluish green is like 0 0.7, 0 0.75, right? And so the reason why I kind of hop on this point is because in a way, I think it communicates the, the importance of sort of architectural innovation in machine learning, right? Uh, because, you know, I mean, I suppose that one, one kind of contrarian view would be all that matters is data. And no matter how much you, you do into the model, if you have less data or more data, you'll just do better. But what this is suggesting that AlphaFold 2 is essentially 100 times more data efficient than AlphaFold 1, right? That AlphaFold 2 can sort of beat AlphaFold 1 um, uh, with 100 of the data, right? And that's, that's really kind of, I think, uh, impressive. Okay, but of course, structure space is not random, right? There, there, there's structure to it. Um, and so, so in this case, we, we sort of lean on CAF and, and their classification in terms of, you know, sort of classes, architectures, and topologies. And so what would happen if we sort of start, you know, sort of reducing the data in, in this way and, and see how well does the model generalize, uh, you know, to, to these different groups. So, so first we started out with topologies, right? And so what I'm showing you here is now sort of topology-based reduction. So we, we cluster the PDB, we, we bucket it into the topologies, and then we remove topologies and we change topologies. And the, the percentage here is relative to the number of topologies, not relative to the number of structures, right? Um, so not surprisingly, you know, you, you do see a stronger hit. Okay? When, when, you, when you go down to 5%, you know, it's below that 0.6 line, but, but it's still pretty comparable to half fold one, right? So again, you know, surprisingly, surprisingly good. Um, and this actually holds up even when you think about architectures, right? So again, you see that even when you're down to five architectures and five architectures is like, you know, this, I think there's maybe 32 architectures in the PDB, uh, you know, I mean, in classification. So, so like 5% is like two. So you say training on two architectures and you're testing on the rest and you see, you know, again, surprisingly uh, good performance. And I think that the most surprising to me was this one. So if, if we train on such on alpha helical proteins, largely alpha helical proteins, and this on beta beta dominated proteins or vice versa, we get something surprisingly usable. Um, and, and this is this is this is an example of that. So um, so let me kind of just go walk you through this. So on the top is that so the, the, the first the, the, the orange is the the, the, the PDB structure. Um, and this is a, a, a mainly a helical protein. The pink or magenta is alpha trained on uh, on uh, largely helical proteins, and sure enough, it covers it pretty well. And then the green is open fold trained on largely beta proteins, beta sheet proteins. And then you see it's still kind of lengthens to you know it's, it's hallucinating a, sheet, a small sheet when it shouldn't, but generally speaking, it's not terrible. Uh, and, and the converse is on the bottom where, where it's a, a primarily beta, beta sheet protein, and you see similar thing. And I mean, the, the magenta is quite interesting there, right? Because it doesn't really cover, you know, it doesn't get the secondary structure of packing correct, but it sort of knows where to place the, the thread, right? So it gets to see alpha backbone essentially, right? Uh, even, even though, you know, the, again, like the hydrogen bonding network isn't quite correct. So, so it's surprisingly robust. And I, you know, I feel, <laughs> I feel okay sort of, um, I don't know, kind of describing the model in very sort of effusive terms because it's not our model, right? This is, you know, this is alpha fold. We just simply implemented it using, you know, using this different architect, this different uh, code base, but it's really quite remarkable what they managed to do, I think, uh, with this. Um, now there is, there is something of a, of a, of a, I would say kind of size dependence to this, you know, uh, scale dependence. Uh, so here, when you do this kind of sharding experiment again, where we fragment the, 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 the structure, you do see that uh, for example, um, you know, when, when you're looking at full length proteins, the drop in performance, right, as a function of reduced data sets for topology, for example, is more severe, right, on, on the kind of the pink side versus the blue side, right? So this is suggesting, and, and not surprisingly, that kind of local aspects of protein structure are sufficiently kind of universal that even if you have a small fraction of the PDB, you can learn them. But sort of more global aspects of structure, you, you, you want to see them, right? So, you, so you, you, you need to have a more representative sample. Of the of the of the PDB uh, and similarly similar thing for architecture, but but I do think I mean this is exciting because I think it suggests that when we think about moving to a new modality, right? so for example RNA, uh, it may not be as hopeful as it first seems because we, we we may not need you know thirty years worth of, of crystallography to actually to actually do this and maybe we can get away with, with less data and that that's I think promising. Um, this is a bit of a detail so I think I'll I'll, I'll skip this so so let me sort of. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good time to wrap up. So let me let me um, let me just kind of end here uh, with, with a couple of points. So you know, so we have we've sort of kind of a multi-stage process. We we have the full implementation, like I said. Uh, we you kind of you know I think we've demonstrated production capability now. Uh, and what we're interested in sort of moving forward, obviously, maybe not surprising, is is you know building on this to go to go in new directions, right? So there are also questions that we want to go after, right? Um, including you know single sequence prediction, you know being able to predict how variants alter structure, um, integration with experiments. I, I mentioned alpha link. This wasn't our work, but you know somebody you know built an open fold, but that's that's great to see, and that's you know obviously some of this will be community driven. We can't do it all. Um, 
multiple conformations. That's an area of sort of outstanding interest, small molecules, you know, small ligands and so on, and, and design. And so so the, the idea here is to, you know, what, what OpenFold is kind of morphing into is something that's a bit more of a consortium type of effort uh, where, you know, industry partners essentially kind of support the effort, but um, uh, but in a way kind of, uh, you know, provide, provide prioritization as to what are the most interesting uh, direction to go after. Uh, but this is certainly not, you know, I mean, to be honest, right now it's primarily an academic effort. So this is by no means kind of, you know, uh, exclusively driven by industry. And so, you know, part of this is I'm very keen to know what people, what people think are interesting problems to go after, because we want to be, we want to go after the problems that people are, are interested in. Uh, and again, that's not to say that I think what DeepMind's done is amazing, but, but of course, I mean, it's a company and they have their particular interests that they're going after. And I think it makes sense to have something that's more community driven and it reflects the, you know, reflects the, the interests and needs of that community. So yeah, so with that, I'll stop. Um, just want to mention kind of Gustav Adritz and, and, and Nazim Bawata, who both kind of led the, led the work on, the, on OpenFold, and a few other folks on kind of more on the organizing side who've been, who've been extremely helpful. And um, yeah, and this is my group. Uh, thanks for your attention. I have to take questions. <laughs> So uh, thank you. Let's start with questions in the room. Ezra. I thought the reduced data set was interesting, but could you but if you consider that about 50% of the PDB was released in the last 10 years, did you do anything in terms of looking at what was available at what time in the history? Because yeah. you're, you're getting the benefit of all the PSI structures, for instance. Absolutely, are... absolutely. Yes, I, I, I agree. And I, I, it's, it's an oft, you know, often given, it's, it's a very common request to, to, to do this. Uh, I, I think, I think we'll, we'll have to do it, we'll break down and do it. You know, the, the problem is, you know, each of those lines I showed you was about $50,000 of compute. And we didn't pay for it, but these are very expensive. So we can't do too many of them. But but yes, that makes perfect sense. And I think the question of PCI is really interesting. So it's one I'm particularly keen on testing. So I, I think we'll we'll just do it, but, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, so do you want to take the question from the chat? Yes, yes, sure. So, so could could you elaborate more on sidechain orientation prediction in regards to core packing? Um, yes, a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what, what the question wants me to elaborate on. Um, I mean, I can tell you what I think is happening in AlphaFold. So, so AlphaFold is sort of interesting in the sense that it represents things fundamentally at the level of residues, and in particular, really at the level of backbone orientation. So it's not directly sort of reasoning of our um, atomic coordinates. It's really as it's sort of reducing proteins to these sort of triangles at each residue and just re reasoning over these for the most part. At the very, very end, side chains are predicted, uh, side chain atoms are predicted, but, but in general, you know, most of the reasoning is happening at that, at that level of coarseness. Uh, yet it's, it's actually pretty decent. It's not perfect, and I, I think it could be improved, but it's it's, it's reasonably decent. I, I think what this suggests to me is that the um, if you do include orientational information, right? So if you know how the residue is oriented, how the backbone is oriented, and you know how all the other backbones around it are, are, are oriented, that is sufficiently sufficiently constraining that then it becomes a you know a reasonably easy problem, not not by any means solved, but a reasonably easy problem to go from that to the full atomic detail. Um, but but you know having said that I mean I think it, it's probably interesting to think of modifications of OpenFold that would uh, that would actually reason directly over atomic coordinates and I, I think that's certainly going to be key for dealing with small molecules right because there you can't you can't do this sort of trick where you treat them as you know these sort of coarse grained triangles um, so that's that's something we're 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 interested in moving towards I'm, I'm not sure that covers the question but that that's what I would say. Uh, thank you. Huh. Go ahead. Hi. Uh... Excellent talk. Um, in genomics, we understand try to study mutations. So, can you elaborate on why the mutation prediction on the effect on the printing structure is not good, and maybe how it can be improved? Yes, yes, that's a great question. So, it, it's actually a fairly fundamental problem. So, I, I, I mean, I think we'll we'll get there eventually, but I'm less optimistic about like very fast progress on, on this front. Um, so the, the fundamental issue is that all these predictions, including AlphaFold, are based on multiple sequence alignments, right? So you, you're getting, um, now you can actually get away with a, a few dozen 
homologous sequences. It used to require tens of thousands of sequences, but you still need you know, some number of homologous sequences. And the prediction is being made on that set of homologous sequences, right? So fundamentally, what that's really saying is that you're essentially kind of making an average prediction over the family level. Right? You, you sort of you 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 you're exploiting the fact that across these sequences, the structure was preserved, and you're trying to identify the patterns that kind of give rise to the to that preservation, to the to the kind of what keeps the structure together, right? So almost by definition, a mutation that kind of disrupts uh, that structure in, in in this particular way is going to uh, almost contradict that underlying assumption, right? Because the assumption is that you know, th those sequences tell you what the structure looks like. And, and in this case, it doesn't anymore because actually it breaks that, that structural motif. Um, so that, that's why these methods don't work very well because, because they really depend on that, on that conservation. And, and this is partly why I say, I think it's gonna be a bit challenging because if you do try, for example, to train a version of alpha, alpha fold, open fold, just from single sequences and go to the structure, there is a pretty significant performance hit. Uh, so it, it's not yet able to simply, you know, make the inference based on that individual sequence. It sort of needs that kind of almost crutch of knowing what all the other sequences around it look like. And why don't we take the, the question from the chat from Joan uh, Segura, who said, works for the PDB in San Diego. Sure. So it so says, for the protein ligand prediction problem, where do you see the main bottleneck? Uh, the available experimental structures of finding the right network architecture. Um, I think both, uh, you know, I, I, so I will say before the, the, the kind of the data reduction experiments we did, I, my answer would have been more like data. I would have said more, there's just very little data. And in particular, the, the issue with obviously with ligands is that chemical space is much larger, right? So you're, 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 you're working with a much more complex kind of chemical object than you are with proteins. But the data reduction experiments are pretty promising, right? I mean, they, they do show that one is able to learn perhaps from much more limited data than one would think. Um, so I am somewhat optimistic that we can at least make you know, some, some progress on this problem, some, some important progress on this problem uh, with, with, with architectural innovations. I suspect it's, it's going to have the, the kind of the property of being maybe somewhat wed to um, you know, what drug discovery programs have, have largely explored, right? So it's probably won't work for kind of arbitrary natural products. You're probably gonna have to, it's probably gonna work well for things that chemists synthesize, you know, medicinal chemists synthesize, but maybe not for arbitrary, you know, sort of aromatic rings. Um, but, 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 you know, we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic now than I was a year ago because of these data reduction experiments. Sagar? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, I was struck by this, the plot that you showed of PLDDT versus IDDT as a function of training steps, right? Mm -hmm. Where the model is starts out as somewhat overconfident then becomes underconfident. So it's, but largely it seems like it's, it knows. Yeah. Um, so how does it know? I mean, yeah, so, well, even without training, right? I mean, well, with a little bit of training, but, yeah. but, but yeah. Yeah. So my, my guess is what's happening, right? Is that it, it must be an easier problem. I, I guess that's the first thing, right? It must be an easier problem so that it doesn't require all that training to actually start to do well on it, right? Um, and presumably what's happening, right? So, you know, the, the last function of alpha fold is very comp composite, right? It's got m multiple components, like s seven or eight terms. Um, and presumably what's happening is that in the beginning of training, there's a lot for it to gain by getting that component right, right? Because that's going to lower the overall loss. So it sort of pays for it to kind of learn to self-assess early on. And, and given that uh, the hypothesis being that's an easier problem, putting those two things together, maybe it's not so surprising that it can do this. But that, that's, I mean, that's purely intuition at this point. We haven't, you know, we don't really know. I mean, one way to test this, I suppose, is to make, so, you know, these various terms have different weights. So perhaps if you turn down the weight for the uh, self-assessment, the performance might, might nosedive or might at least take longer before it's recovered. That, that's, I think it's a plausible uh, expectation. Yeah, I mean, with the data, uh, with the data reduction and this you yeah. know, good prediction of PLDDT, I think that could be, Amazing for design proteins, right? yes, because yes. you can just very quickly. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, yeah. Right. right. So th th there is one wrinkle, though. Here. So I mentioned um, single sequences and so on. So the, the the trick with design, in some case, is that it for for for, de for design proteins that we know work, it's very good usually at getting their structure, surprisingly good in a way. But in part, I think that reflects the fact that they're sort of very optimized to be like you know very kind of uh, optimized to structure elements and so on. What it has more trouble with are designs that don't work and it seems to kind of often generate false positives. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's perhaps because it's not using MSAs again. And so it's something of a distributional shift. Um, one thing we did see, which is interesting though, so sort of an interesting kind of uh, observation was that <clears throat> if you if you take the alpha fold two ways, the ones that DeepMind had, and then again, do this experiment I just said, oftentimes it, it generates false positives. You take the same thing with open fold, 
and also does the same thing. However, they don't agree on which ones are going to, on, on the set that is incorrect, they don't always predict the structure. So they disagree there. On the set that does work, they, they, they agree. So that suggests that if you have multiple models, that may give you a way to discriminate between true and, and sort of uh, false positives. So, so that, that's another direction I think would be interesting. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Jose? Um, maybe um, since you mentioned that um, about re data reduction experiments, um, I'm wondering if you did anything with MSA reduction. So trying to reduce the size of the MSAs or the yeah. type of uh, sequences that go into the MSA. Yeah, so so we, we've gone to the extreme, which is not using MSAs at all. Uh, and, you know, instead of two two ways, either with, with language models, those those things that sort of kind of try to learn a, a broad model of, of, of protein sequence space, um, or without, just going directly to, to sequence. Um, like I said, there is definitely a performance penalty, but 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 I'm I'm fairly optimistic, actually. I mean, we're, we're beginning to train models now that are not, again, compared with AlphaFold 2, but they are better than AlphaFold 1, uh, certainly, and that are just working off of single sequence. Uh, so, so I think I think we we can get there. Um, and, and interestingly, stop sampling MSAs has been useful for generating alternate confirmations. Uh, it, it's essentially you know the the, the the intuition there being perhaps that you know different regions of sequence space might have simply slightly different landscapes, and so you can kind of get get out of the confirmation landscape that way. Um, but but yeah, but we we've sort of pushed it all the way to to no MSA, and that that's where we're sort of focusing our our effort because we want to get to that variant problem, being able to predict how mutations affect structure. Thank you, Jose. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Why don't we uh, why don't you tackle that, please? Let me scroll. Sorry, yeah. Hard to see the cursor. Maybe it's easier to see it this way. Yeah. Maybe you can scroll. Ah. Oh, but I have to keep. No, no, scroll on the uh, uh, on the bar on the sidebar there. Yeah, maybe maybe that gets you. All right. So. Okay. Is this a question? Yeah. Jason. So alpha helix beta sheet cost training an explanation could be that the Machadon region of beta strand is filled in in the alpha data set by loops, coils, and turns. So the backbone can be predicted, but not packing. And would the accuracy be comparable if you train on an equivalent number of residues from the beta structures, i.e. a large number of alpha structures have a similar number of residues in the beta region to a small number of beta structures. Um, that, that may well be true, I mean, I think broadly. I mean, so we trained on, you know, the, main, the mainly alpha and mainly beta uh, cast categories, right? So they were not entirely devoid, I should say, uh, of, of alpha helices and beta sheets. And you're quite right that obviously, you know, kind of the, the Machandrian sort of distribution is, is going to constrain this. So, so I don't think it's, it's not magic, you know, to, to, to be clear. Um, yeah, I mean, so I, but, but it's still surprising, right? Because what, what, typically happens in kind of machine learning models is, you know, as, as soon as you kind of shift the distribution a little bit of your data, everything completely falls apart. And this is not happening here. So I think what this is suggesting is that perhaps using this kind of Machandian argument, it's learning something about the underlying physics and, and it's able to use those to generalize. Not perfectly, but but it's not, it's not, it's not sort of a simple lookup table. It's doing something more sophisticated. And that's that's only, I think, that the, the, the claim that can be made. Well, thank you very much. That uh, that was a, an inspiring and uh, very provocative talk. Uh, we have a little bit of PDB swag for you. To, uh, oh, exciting, very for exciting. Your, uh, for your uh, <laughs> participation. You. Oh, thank you. Uh, so first, we have um, a Ooh, that looks so Yeti good. bottle wow, with a PDB cool. logo on it. <laughs> PDB logo. That will last. That, if you take care of that, that yeah. will, you'll be able to hand that over to your, grand, your grandchildren. Excellent, excellent. Um, <laughs> And then you you mentioned small molecules. Uh -huh. We are very interested in small molecules, of course, particularly me because of my time in industry. And a card game was it was developed between Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center (CCDC) and uh, RCSB Protein Data Bank called Bound. And what it does is to match ah, experimental structures in the PDB <laughs> with the small molecules That's that excellent. bind to those targets. So many of them are US FDA approved drugs, of oh. course. Um, <laughs> and uh, the importance of structure guided drug discovery cannot be yes. cannot be overstated. So um, I look forward to you tackling this issue of where is it? Fourth. Yes. Fourth uh, one. Oh, yeah. Protein small molecule. Protein small molecule yes. interactions. I think that's going to be extremely yeah, this important. This will be very helpful for that purpose. <laughs> yeah, I think it will. It'll, it'll, it'll help, it will help with your, your data problem. Yes, yes. Uh, but, uh, yeah, exactly. There you go. There you go. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, 
industry will be, I think, extremely important in um, coming to grips with the protein small molecule problem because there's so much yeah. data behind the firewalls of um, of large uh, global you know, multinational drug companies. Uh, it's estimated conservatively that the total number of co-crystal structures that are being held confidentially inside companies exceeds, that's across all the companies that are doing this, exceeds the number of structures that are in the PDB today. Yeah. Now, many of those are somewhat redundant because it's just a methyl group being added here and there, but those are in fact the data that are needed to, uh, I think, to, to do the training. Yeah. Uh, so with that, we thank you very much uh, for visiting us. Sure. We have lunch for uh, with the IQB graduate students now, and then a discussion with the PDB and then further meetings with, with faculty. So thank you again. Yeah, great, great talk. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.